Good afternoon, everyone. I know we're just before lunch, so we'll try to uh, get out of here as soon as we can, but we have a lot of ground to cover. And David, it's so good to see you, and uh, welcome to the World Strategic Forum. Uh, I, what's interesting it isn't that uh, you're here, but uh, also that you're new to South Florida. So tell us, let's start there. What brought you to South Florida, and how has it worked so far for you? Well, first of all, thank you, John. Very nice to meet you. Thank you to the Forum for hosting this wonderful summit that brings together folks from government, from business, from family offices, from regulatory, from innovators. It's, it's a good combination. And that's the kind of thing that brought me here. It was really this search, restless search that entrepreneurs and investors have to find the next horizon, where, where, what's over the edge. And in, in our world, the good governance of the state of Florida and, and of Miami and this area is really attractive and it's, it's, it's liberating. So I feel terrific. My family feels great. We've settled in here. The kids are in a great school. Um, I'm finding interesting partners for investment, entrepreneurs. Um, the ecosystem is supportive. Good place. How is the, that's an interesting point. How is the uh, investment ecosystem here compared uh, to San Francisco? Well, I think the interesting thing that the COVID crisis uh, saw, saw all of us understand is the tragedy of that. But as every, we all know that every dark cloud has a silver lining. So what we saw that, in fact, I created a little acronym that COVID is also, of course, coronavirus identified in 19, 19, 2019, but it's also the catalyst for virtualization, innovation, and decentralization. Those were the technology trends that we saw that, that blossomed in 2020. And, and, and will continue going forward. It's an accelerating motion for fintech, for telemedicine, for edutech in a remote sense, all kinds of virtualization that was blocked by traditional behaviors and certain regulatory uh, issues that have been liberated and, and the world is moving forward. It'll be more progressive because it'll be lower cost, faster, better, cheaper, and available to many, many more individuals, biz small businesses, and uh, enterprise customers than ever before. Well, one of the things that you talked about, you've talked about at uh, Bloomberg is that um, you partner with, uh, you know, early stage uh, firms. Um, and I'm curious about this partnership. Talk to us a bit about what does this partnership look like? Sure. Well, a couple of things. One, our, our investment thesis, we're, we're an early stage classic venture capital firm. And so we're trying to find the most innovative entrepreneurial folks that are building teams and from these small teams grow quite great innovations. It's interesting that years ago, the Fortune 500 companies stayed on that list for 100 years. Today, it's, I think, less than 15 years. The cycle of disruption is so rapid that people are changing over because the innovators can outpace if the incumbents don't adjust and react. Uh, so now, how do we work with our entrepreneurs? Well, many VCs have a model that I call the marionette model. The VC says, jump, and the entrepreneur is supposed to jump. We don't see it that way. We see it more that it's a NASCAR model. You, Mr. Entrepreneur, are the driver, and we are the pit crew, and that we're there to support you and fill the gas and change the oil and bring fans into the stands. We've been around the track many times, so we try and help these entrepreneurs with our experience from our you know, hundreds of companies we've invested in and help them tap into a network that helps them open doors and get there faster than they would on their own. Well, so how do you identify uh, these companies that you invest in? That's a good question. We, we've distilled it into what we call the six T's. T words that are our acronym uh, for an uh, acrostic. And the first one would be theme. What is the problem you're solving? Sometimes you can say that the, finding the right problem is harder than finding the right solution. So the numbers have to be solving a big problem that's difficult and important. Second is the team. Who are you? Do you have the grit, the domain expertise, the persistence to get through? Because the entrepreneurs face doors that they knock on and they get turned down a thousand times before they get a yes. They have to be that persistent type of character that can go the distance. That's number two. Then the terrain. That's a T word for the market. What is the, what's changing about the market? For example, in telemedicine, the deregulatory um, actions of the last administration were very important to allow doctors to now um, do prescriptions and, and do treatment across state lines. That was very helpful for 
fostering of telemedicine, things of that nature. So how's the ground rules changing in your market? Is it sociodemographic change, regulatory change, um, technological change, etc.? Then there's the technology. How does it work? Show us the secret sauce. Uh, we don't sign NDAs. No VCs generally sign NDAs. But we are guardians of confidentiality. We need to keep your, your trust because otherwise our reputation would suffer and we wouldn't do business. So tell us about the technology and how you'll maintain your technological edge uh, going forward. Many people have a great small technological idea, but the idea is to then expand it, the arrow, and then spread it, uh, wedge and spread, uh, and you build a moat, a data moat or a technological moat that ensures that you'll have customers continuing to be loyal to you going forward. That's terrain. Then uh, the te technology. Then there's the timing. How are you going to go to market? Explain that clearly. There's a distributions channel. There are, di there are direct to consumer channels. Um, we tend to, at Bloomberg Capital, tend to invest in most companies that are business to business models, not direct to consumer so much. Um, but all, horses for courses, people can do different things. And then last, I would say, is the, uh, the final T is the terms. How much money does your startup need? And think about it like a ladder or a stair steps. You raise a certain amount of money at the first stage, and then next stage is up. And every time there's uh, investment, there can be dilution to the ownership of the founders. So you want to think that through carefully, not raise too much, not too little. It's like just in the middle, right? You want to be just appropriately fitted like a fine-fitting suit that you're wearing. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering whether many of the companies you invest in do they come to you, or do you, um, do you go out and, um, uh, and sure. find uh, many of these firms? Well, we're open for business, so please, if you're an entrepreneur, come to BlumbergCapital.com, and we'd love to talk to you. Um, the, the other way that we do things is outbound. We have a thesis about big data being mined or analyzed, or uh, mined and analyzed by artificial intelligence particularly machine learning and deep learning, those two things are coming together and they are riding on the rails of uh, the internet and mobility, the, this device that we all carry around, which is so useful. And then the um, uh, other aspect are the infrastructure that we all depend on, the cloud infrastructure, which makes it much more capital efficient for companies to start. They don't need their own PBX system, which those of you old enough to know what that is will understand. They don't have to have all that heavy physical infrastructure. A lot of it can be uh, harnessed on the, on the web. So we like to help entrepreneurs harness this AI, mining big data, and then apply it in verticals of traditional industries. I'll give you a couple examples. A uh, recent deal we did recently uh, applies to mining, a company called Ver.ai, V-E-R.ai, and they harness masses of, in, of, of data that they find private and public sources, and they help mining companies to uh, precisely drill or dig in the exact area where the best, richest veins of ore are. So they don't have to ruffle the feathers of the earth uh, too broadly. It's environmentally improving and it helps save them time and money. That's one example. Then, and these are mining companies around the world, not just... All over the world, yeah. So, so that's the thing. Technology is now global. All of our companies are effectively multinationals when they start. And that's an interesting thing about Miami and this ecosystem here. It's a very international place. Lots of people speak multiple languages. They've come from many places. Many people are refugees from various uh, b bad places, and they know what a blessing it is to be here in this free, wonderful society with human rights and respect of law and all that. So... Entrepreneurs are attracted to that, too. In fact, uh, I'll cite uh, Walter Riston. He used to say that money will go where it's welcome and stay where it's well, well treated. And entrepreneurs and talent follow. So I think that that's a, that's a good thing that Miami's and Florida in general are doing, doing right. Um, but back to the entrepreneurs. They are starting off global. We, we find companies often where the CTO is in one country and the CEO is in another country, and they're building a distributed engineering team. That's pretty novel. Historically, engineering teams had to be generally all in the same room or on multiple floors in a big office. That's no longer as, as true. With new technological uh, advances, communications networks, um, sort of recipes for how to build code, easier ways of doing it, it's easier to have a manage a, a, a distributed team with product managers in one place, certain engineers back end, front end, all distributed. And it seems to be working pretty well. You know, it's interesting, and I had some questions about international later in um, our conversation. I want to ask you this now, since you brought it up. Uh, for folks in our audience who have friends, family, associates in other countries, uh, many of them uh, in the region, Latin America and Caribbean, you are looking, I, I take it, for companies to invest in 
in the region as well. So that's, uh, you know, how, uh, how should they go about um, reaching out to you? Uh, well, about that? again, BloombergCapital.com is our, our website. And, you know, I don't want to be only for us. Every venture capitalist is interested in investing in great entrepreneurs that are doing great things. But what's not very well known is that Lumber Capital in particular, and a lot of international-oriented VCs are job importers. We are bringing companies here. We don't bring the whole company usually. We let the engineers stay in the, maybe the base. But the marketing and sales and finance operations often move here because this is the largest market in the world, and this is the most unified market, and it's the easiest to access. So for early-stage technology, uh, we have companies that have come from Canada, from Germany, from the UK, from Israel, where we have an office, we're very active there. And, and a lot of the companies want to be in the United States as their first point of entry. But the, from there, they're going global. So Latin America is a big part of it. That's part of why I moved down here. I think that there is a new untapped opportunity, not new, it's an untapped opportunity or it's not fully realized. Um, I've traveled in Latin America for decades, love it, speak a little bit of Spanish, need to improve. and. Um, I, I see the power of that, that, that ecosystem. People want to succeed. They want to grow. And I think they, instead of looking only within Latin America, they should look to the full Western Hemisphere, you know, the whole NAFTA. Uh, we have it all together. If we, if we cooperate as a Western Hemisphere, we have the natural resources, we have the tech, we have the young population, especially in Latin America, um, that can really combine in, in a very fruitful cooperation and powerful economic uh, partnership. Well, for people who've researched your firm uh, much like I have, uh, they would have noticed that over uh, a dozen of the companies that uh, you invest in were acquired by a larger firm, uh, which makes me wonder about your strategy. Are you mostly going after companies that have that pot potential, or, um, or what's, what's your strategy? Well, yes. If you, if you look at the website, you will see that right now I think we have approximately 80 companies in our portfolio. And I'm very proud to say, not that we did something great, but the entrepreneurs that we backed did something really great because I think eight or nine of them have become what are called unicorns, companies that are still private and worth over a billion dollars. And what's exciting for us as Bloomberg Capital investors is that we were the first or maximum second investor in all of them. So we say it's taking acorns and turning them into unicorns. And, and the basic idea is finding these big problems with these marvelous teams and then backing them with the support. So we have support for four different tractions. One, we have recruiters that can help them find people. Two, we have business development team that helps them open doors. Mainly, we're looking, frankly, to help corporate America and co the Global 5000 do outsourced R&D. If you really think about the venture capital model, that's what it is. It's outsourced R&D for the Global 5000. It's easier to do innovation outside of a large corporation than inside a large corporation for a lot of reasons that people understand. Equity incentivization, rules and procedures, et cetera, et cetera. I'll give one example. I won't name the company. It's a major credit card company that one of the chief technology officers told me that to do anything, any new innovation, it costs them a minimum of $5 million in regulatory and legal clearances before they can do anything. Okay? And one of the biggest... Um, companies in the world, one of the biggest banks, told me that they spend about 70% of their operating expenses on compliance and legal and just keeping things going. They, they, it's hard for these big companies to innovate. I have empathy for them. It, it's, it's not easy, but the innovation is happening in startups, so we're here as venture capitalists to help large corporations make that connection. We're like a filter. We see for, Our firm sees 4,000 business plans a year. We invest in about 15. And not all of those work. You know, the honest truth of a venture capital firm is about 20% of the companies don't really make it. About 20% of them are superstars. And 60% are kind of that bell curve in the middle with one to three X kinds of returns. So to get those zero to a billion dollar kinds of returns, which we've had more than our fair share of, it is hard to do. It does take a lot of work. And we have to do a lot of outreach. So that's why I come to places like this. My colleagues walk around and we want to meet entrepreneurs family offices, people that are in the deal flow, technologists, people from universities that are pushing the, the edge of, of the science, and that's where we want to be investing. When you talk about billion dollars, in, how, long, how long would it take Great question. for that kind of uh, return, which, which shows your commitment to these companies and how long oh, you stick with them? You just said two great words, timing and commitment. Venture capital, and what I think of as the right kind of investing, I'm, I'm being biased here, is long term. Don't, don't try and make yourself into a hedge fund. You know, as, hedge funds are great for what they do. 
venture capital is a slow, steady sport. So I say that the analogy is, for hedge funds, the sport is surfing. It's waves, it's wind, it's short term, it's a little bit of chaos on the surface. Our sport should be scuba diving. It's long, slow, drift currents, watch out for the reef, don't let a shark eat you. Um, that's what the sport of venture capital should be. Because we found that the time it takes to grow a company from zero to, say, a billion in valuation, or from zero to 100 million in revenue, it can be seven, eight, nine, ten years. It's not short term. Uh, we're steady. We're very persistent. We, we, we stick with these entrepreneurs through thick and thin. Um, the only thing you can't do with us is keep losing money over and over and over and then expect us to invest a lot more at a higher valuation. That generally doesn't happen. And the other thing is any compromise on ethics. We don't, we don't brook that at all. But other than that, we're very patient and we'll help you if you have to pivot from one product iteration toward another. We felt many companies do that. And interestingly, two of them, or three of them, started off as B to C, business to consumer models. And we had an inkling that that was probably not gonna be an easy road to hoe because it would cost so much to get the consumer traction, what's called CAC, cost of customer acquisition, versus the lifetime value of what they could generate. And so we gently steered them and convinced them to move toward a B2B model, a business to business model where that, that ratio fell into line quite, quite clearly, and the companies are now thriving. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the pandemic and, and yeah. um, some of the companies that not only have you invested in, because you mentioned um, the health tech uh, uh, sector mine, yes. earlier. How can they, and how, well, in fact, how can you work with them, with some of them, to help innovate, uh, to prepare for the next pandemic? We're, again, we're the NASCAR model. We support entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurs do the hard work. They're the ones who are really pushing the boundaries and finding others. Let me give you an example of two. One in sports, and then we'll go to, well, I'll start in the pandemic, and then we'll go to more light, lighthearted stuff. Um, in the pandemic side, um, one of the companies we've invested in recently is called Ferrum Health, F-E-R-R-U-M. And they made the interesting analysis that showed that, who knows, who knows what the third leading cause of death in hospitals is? First is cardio. Second is cancer, these are all sad statistics. Third is medical errors. Isn't that shocking? A lot of them are avoidable if we do a better job of marshalling the data. Data in healthcare is often unstructured, it needs to be structured for a database to analyze it. It is often unlabeled, it needs to be labeled for a database to analyze it. It is often um, HIPAA um, con constrained, and so we have to anonymize it to share it with medical researchers around the world. So, uh, that, that's part of what Ferrum does and with other companies. They look at the radiology scans to start, for example, after a day of radiology intensive work in the intensive care unit, and in the dead of night when the people are busy, the computer can look and find errors that have been made. And the next morning, we can help correct that error or gently say, gee, maybe we need a second opinion on this lung uh, mass that we find. Uh, so it's, it's things like that. Using data to low cost make things better. That's one example. Then move to the lighter side um, in a company called Zone 7, which applies AI to sports management, helping teams keep their players fit and avoiding injuries so they can be more time on the field, less time uh, in recuperation. If you think about it, people wear Fitbits. Well, athletes have not only Fitbits, but they have all kinds of devices that can get their data in real time during training and in games. We have their medical records, and with their permission, of course, we can help them understand that they need more hamstring stretches or, or calf stretches or something before this intensity uh, period of play. So it's marshalling data can find optimization, kind of better routing, preventive, better underwriting. You don't, any domain in the world can be improved by marshalling of data and that's what the new technology, GPUs from places like NVIDIA, uh, using AI algorithms designed, most of them open source by the way, uh, to move us forward to a higher level of Pareto optimality for the world. So we can do more with less. It's a good future. And do you see that uh, one of the results of the pandemic, or is that something that would have happened organically on its own? Bloomberg Capital does a survey that's on our, our website on fintech every year. And we found that the jump from people thinking that you know, going into a physical bank is sort of ending jumped from about 47% of the population to 67% last year. Because for the first time, I myself used it. This is my new wallet. I don't use my physical wallet anymore, much at all. I, I do everything on the phone. 
it's a better way to go. And I had the old behavior, and now I have the new behavior. Many people in developing countries leapfrogged places like the United States because we had a pretty good terrestrial phone network. They didn't have that, so they went directly to mobile phones, wireless, and so on. You've seen that when you travel around the world. So this is a good thing. So I'm not saying that COVID virus is a good thing, not at all, nor do I think the lockdowns are generally a good thing. But I think that the technological response of entrepreneurs has been magnificent. And I want to applaud these entrepreneurs who have really you know, struggled through lonely times and difficult financial situations to persevere and bring forth technology that will help everyone. But do you see that uh, as something, uh, like the U.S. is often, it seems to me, a, a bit slower because as you travel, and most people you travel around the world, you see that, uh, many other countries um, seem to be a step ahead of us in these um, uh, advances. Uh, I mean, how, do you see the, the U.S. catching up any more quickly now than we, we would have otherwise? Well, I, I might disagree slightly with your premise. I, I think that's a yes and a no. I think the United States still is the easiest market for most companies selling technology to enter. It's the, it's the, it's the go-to place. Um, it's, it's unified. It has a rule of law. For all of our problems, we still are an amazing place to, to get things done. Um, and, you know, not, not to pick on any places, but you, you see what's happening to some of the big tech companies in China these days. Mm -hmm. It's not a pretty picture. Um, so we don't have that happening uh, quite the same way uh, here. I think still for foreseeable future, as far as I can see, is North America, Europe, Japan, uh, are going to be the big market entry places. Places that are rising, India, I would put a long, long bet on India as a place that will do very, very well going forward. And I think LATAM has great, great potential. Again, young population, increasingly educated. And then what you talked about is using technology. Yes, again, I was talking about the leapfrog phenomenon where a country that did not have, say, terrestrial networks jumped right into mobile. And in Asia, they jumped right into mobile payments because they didn't have good banking systems uh, in, in many areas. So that, those are areas exactly where, where there's a problem and the new technology platforms can help us jump forward and leap into the new future. It's better, and often the younger countries can leap ahead of the older ones. You're right. Because we have legacy infrastructure. Yeah, because one of the things that was behind the question was uh, one of my trips to South Korea many years ago, uh, I was sort of fascinated that people were using tap to, to, um, right. to, to, to spend and buy things at various stores. And I came back to the U.S. and wondered, mm -hmm. why aren't we using this? Right. Well, we're using a lot more now because of the pandemic. A lot of people don't... One, one, one that. little statistic I read just uh, in our, some of our studies, um, that the amount of telemedicine consultations increased 38 times last year over prior. I don't think that's going to go back so much. I mean, my doctor is, you know, miles away from me. I'd rather do it, you know, virtually if I can. Not every treatment or, or diagnosis can be done virtually. But those that can will increasingly be done so. Just like not every time you used to have to go into the bank to do anything, now we have many things that can be done without walking into a physical branch. That, that's going to increasingly be true more and more. It seems that we're, the time is going really quickly. But I want to ask you about AI and, and yes. talk about your, uh, your company's investment in AI and how do you view uh, AI uh, going forward? Well, again, what we're just finding is that AI, really, if you don't know about AI, artificial intelligence, there's machine learning, which is sort of learning from a pattern. There's deep learning, which is a deep neural network, which has multiple iterations of the learning, which can go on and find sort of less bounded problems. These are super important for the future of the world and for each of you. So dig in a little bit to learn what it is. The basic application, though, is in, again, mining data. 95% of data in corporations is never used after it's gathered. Isn't that amazing? It's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, it's a liability, and yet it's, it has value. It's like a coal mine that had, I'm, I'm using a bad mining analogy, but a coal mine with diamonds sprinkled in. Now, everybody sees the coal, but there's diamonds in there. So this data, if it's properly analyzed at low cost, which now CPU, GPUs and AI allow you to do, you can mine this data and you find non-obvious correlations, you find ability to do cheaper underwriting, uh, better diagnostics, better treatment plans, you name it. Any area of, of domain can be improved through that. So we learned this really from our, our entrepreneurs. Um, at first, we, when we thought about AI, we said, oh, we should look at the AI companies that are broad AI engines. And later we learned that that was a harder thing to do because that was pioneering. You have to do a lot of market education. Instead, what worked out better for us and for our entrepreneurs 
is going down a vertical market using applying AI and their own data. And then you go to the hospital and say, we can help you with a specific problem for your hospital. Then they're listening. If you talk to a hospital about general AI, they'll say it's nice, but be practical. So the, for entrepreneurs, the recommendation is go down these verticals and, and you can marshal this new technology, which other people don't know about yet, and then, but you, you solve a real specific tangible problem that delivers ROI or a better new quality that could never be delivered before. Well, Mark, we may have time just probably just one more question, but I wanted to ask you about cybersecurity. We've all seen the yes. stories and, um, you know, what, uh, what's happened uh, around this country and certainly around the world. Right. What are your concerns about that, particularly as you look to invest in uh, various we have a very large office in, our, in Tel Aviv and about 30 companies uh, there. Many of them come from an elite unit of Israeli military intelligence called the 8200 unit. So they know cybersecurity really well and they do a great job of it. So our cybersecurity companies are doing masterful work in protecting. The problem with cybersecurity is it is so fragmented. Every new platform, every new device, every new operating system will usually be discovered later to have certain new flaws. And the, Criminals are very, very uh, intelligent, and they find things out. And then we have non-state actors, terrorist groups, and then we have state actors also. So we have a master, a, a three-way uh, attack force that's criminal, non-state actors, terrorist groups, and governments. All three are attacking. So the defenders are uh, put upon. The hard part for most corporations is that a large corporation might have 50 to 100 cybersecurity vendors. Each vendor has two or three products. Each product issues thousands and thousands of alerts per day. It's overwhelming. Include, include on that the fact that there's about 3 million person shortage of cybersecurity experts today in the world and 350,000 alone in the U.S. shortage. So we need to automate more, orchestrate more, and use intelligence to triage us and help get to remediation. Right. Well, Mark, look, I want to thank you for, this con for the conversation. I want to welcome you again to Miami. Good to be and here. certainly also welcome you to the World Strategic Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you and uh, thank help you. me congratulate and thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks, John.